the vision was football and diabetes because that was my strength. That's what I knew well. But I think there's a, you know, by using the hook of the world's biggest sport with the condition that's affecting the most, you know, the biggest chronic medical condition affecting children, you're already bringing two very, very big uh, parts of society together, which hopefully we can help influence how, you know, the one part is, is, um, is thought of. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Craig and I'm your host. So probably one of the biggest sports on the planet is soccer or football as it's commonly known in most parts of the world. And this has played a central role in the life of our guest on today's show. Chris Bright was raised in a town just outside of Birmingham in the UK. A kid who never sat still, Chris spent much of his time kicking around a ball when he was a kid. He was also a shy kid but he developed a bit of a chip on his shoulder after being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the young age of 8 years old. Now today we talk about a defining moment with a pediatric nurse at the time of his diagnosis, and we also talk about the importance of having that one person in our lives who pulls down any potential for barriers, especially at the start of a challenging journey. We talk about the support of his family, we discuss the challenges associated with figuring out his body to enable him to perform at the highest levels on the field of play. And we also talk about the importance of the continued focus on the quality of perseverance in any aspect of our lives. Now, Chris also shares some details about the next stage of his journey, including the formation of the diabetes football community and the first all type one diabetic football team. Now, if you're an athlete or if you're simply looking for inspiration and guidance to help you on your path in athletics, this is really a must-listen-to episode of the podcast. Now, before we get into the conversation with Chris, today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Greater Than, the apparel company with the huge mission of showing the world that we are all greater than the challenges we face. Visit imgreaterthan.com to view their lineup of hats, of t-shirts, and hoodies, and use the code BRAVEST at checkout for 10% off your entire order. And keep in mind, a portion of all profits go straight to support diabetes research. So visit imgreaterthan.com and use the code BRAVEST at checkout for 10% off your entire order. Now also, if you're a fan of the show, uh, you know that I'm always interested in looking for opportunities for myself, as well as for you guys, to take concepts from the show into the real world. So here's a really interesting opportunity to meet up with other type 1s, to challenge yourself, and also have some fun in the process. You're probably familiar with the nonprofit group called Beyond Type 1, as well as Connected in Motion. Now, what's really cool is that these two organizations have teamed up this summer to bring adults who are living with type 1 diabetes three retreat weekends. So I want you to think about diabetes camp, but with more free time, and what they're saying is beers around the campfire. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the type 1 diabetes community. You'll get a chance to get outside. You'll be able to recharge and refresh. Now, 2018 weekends are scheduled for dates in Maine, in Southern California, and also in Ontario, Canada. But they're definitely going to be worth traveling for. So to get more information and to register, I want you to head on over to beyondtype1.org forward slash slipstreams2018 and secure your spot now. So go on over to beyond type one forward slash slipstreams 2018 for all the info and to get one of these unique getaways on your calendar today. All right, guys, let's get into it with our guest this week, Chris Bright, and how he's following his true passion to forge the path to the first all type one competitive futsal team. Rare, yeah. rarely ever happens that's cool but yeah no look yeah. I, I really appreciate you coming on you're, you're on the other side of the planet you're o over in the uk and uh, i'm sitting here in cold new york which uh, we're we're really looking forward to some warmer weather here it's been quite the winter here <laughs> so wait <laughs> i'm sure yeah so so chris bright uh, you, you you've got this amazing story um and work that you're involved in now with the diabetes football community 
uh, while it's it's a new organization or a relatively new organization, uh, it's starting to make a, a really big impact. So I'm excited to have you on the show. I'm excited to kind of get into all of that with you today. But first, I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. No, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on, Craig, as well. My pleasure. So, you know, like oftentimes I like to kind of go back in time and kind of dig into my guest's childhood. And I think that that says a lot about who we are as adults. And, you know, I guess maybe we can just start off by just really kind of diving into where it all started for you. Where'd you grow up? So um, I grew up in a place called Redditch, um, which is just south of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. Um, and to be fair, I'm, I'm still in the same area that I, um, that I grew up in. And... Um, yeah, I was kind of a, an active kid, as you can imagine. But with, with what I do now, I was I was always out playing sport. Uh, football was the passion, so I was. Um, and it, growing up in the, I guess the nineties, there was no mobile phones, there was no technology, so it was more about, you know, let's go knock on my mate's house and uh, let's go out for a kick around. So I spent a lot, a lot of my childhood was spent running around, uh, kicking a ball around with with my mates, really. And um, yeah, and I, I, I guess. Part way through it was uh, I was kind of dealt with the um, with the diagnosis of type one diabetes. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely get into the diagnosis story too. So, yeah. so what you're telling me is that you actually uh, spent your childhood outside talking to other human beings. That's pretty amazing. That's rare nowadays. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, if you said that to a kid nowadays, I'm pretty sure they'd be shut. But I, uh, you know, you go outside and you you play you play with a ball outside, like uh, yeah. I spent all of my life as a child, um, you know, if there was ever school holidays or vacations or wherever, whatever it was, it would, would have been outside with a ball, uh, with the lads or running around, you know, climbing trees, you know, the things that people forget that, you know, you used to do with with childhood. I, I was lucky that I kind of, I got that, um, that mix of technology just creeping into the end of my childhood. So I kind of learned about tech and phones and all that sort of stuff, just as I was I'd already experienced the the kind of outdoorsy life as a kid as well. I, I'm I'm thinking that uh, the 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 loss to a certain extent of of kids spending more of their time outside than they do on on screens at this point. Uh, I'm wondering what we're going to see from a health perspective as life goes forward uh, for them. We I mean, maybe we'll just have monstrous yeah. brains and really really big thumbs uh, in the generations <laughs> to come. <laughs> Um, yeah, the evolutionary of uh, the evolutionary developments of human beings, and we uh, we change to adapt to phones and technology. That's right. It's just kind of implantable devices now yeah. for for us. How would your parents describe you as a kid? Um, never sat still. Uh, that's the, that's the words I always hear uh, when we talk about me as a kid. Uh, annoying. Um, always bugging them to do something. Always up. Always trying to be active. Um, I remember as a kid, if we were ever indoors or it was raining outside, I'd have a little ball in the lounge and I would literally be kicking it around. I'd be diving around the lounge. Um, I broke things in the lounge. It was, you know, I was that kind of kid that literally couldn't, you know, I was, just couldn't put stuff down. And, and especially if it was a ball or, or anything like that, I'd be throwing it around and be kicking it. We had a little goal for the lounge as well. So it was a... Uh, um, yeah, I think they would say annoying, but I think at the same time, I think they always felt my, my maybe my heart was in the right place. But uh, they, you know, they just they couldn't uh, they couldn't stop me, I suppose, from messing around a little bit. Sure, good insurance policies on all the expensive stuff in the house. Yes, yeah, yeah, there was, I think. <laughs> so, how would how would your friends describe you as a kid? Oh, um, I think smiley, happy um positive but i think i was um i was quite shy um and i wonder um if i became more shy um as a result of kind of moving from not having a medical condition to living with type 1 diabetes i was shy until people got to know me um so around friends i was quite a confident guy but i think a confident kid but i think i um moving outside of that and to new people I was I was quite yeah quite quiet but um yeah I was positive um and I guess I would say fun I, I like to do you know I was always encouraging them to get out you know be active and, and go and have a laugh because I think it was 
um, you know, I was about enjoying life. I still am about enjoying life now. So I think that would probably what they would say about me. So it's interesting because you said that that uh, you were shy, but and you also felt the diagnosis kind of changed you a little bit. So you were diagnosed mm. at, at eight years old. Um, what do you what do you think about the diagnosis changed your mentality? Were, was there a, kind of a lack of confidence after you were diagnosed? Were you uncertain about the future? And I know that's a big question for an eight year old mm. to think about. But what really changed at that point in time for you? I think um, I think. There was maybe a bit of me that started to worry about. Um, I, I was obviously dealt with something that made me look different, and at that time I was uh, maybe eight or nine. Is a bit blissfully unaware of the, the way the world is, but I think as I was a year or so later, which is still quite early in, into my diagnosis and into living with the condition, I moved schools and immediately go from um, it was a kind of first school to middle school. Uh, in, in the area I live. So I went from mixing with nine-year-olds down to sort of four or five-year-olds to mixing with nine to 13-year-olds. And that's a very different mix and the way that children are. Um, I think that probably, that was quite early and quite a difficult um, mix to to deal with. And um, going from being the oldest in the school to the youngest in the school, I think it just made me take a step back as well. And I kind of felt a bit maybe in awe of the kind of school I was around and um but this is like me analyzing it now I, at the time I just think it was um new things um scary things at the same time and I think I just I think it was easier to just kind of take it inwards rather than put it outwards and um, and make it visible so I took a lot of it in um and I think it, it probably showed a lot of how I actually dealt with my type 1 diabetes for a very long time that I took it in rather than expressed it. Do you think it made you stronger to a certain extent because you had to deal with this stuff on your own? Um, yes. Uh, I talk about it now. I think the um, I think I've always used it as a bit of a, a fuel to the fire. Um chip on the shoulder is what I call it and I, I carry it around and and I guess I use it to to uh, pet me up to go if you know uh, it's a situation where I think my type 1 diabetes could be a challenge to manage I actually go you know what I'm going to do it and I'm going to show it that it's not and I've always kind of used it in that way I actually wonder sometimes if without type 1 diabetes would I have been as motivated as and as determined as I am to go on and achieve and push myself it, it, I'll never know but I always wonder it yeah of course so, so you were diagnosed in ninety nine, right? Yeah, nineteen ninety nine. Which yeah. month? Which month were you diagnosed? I'm just curious. September. That's interesting because I was diagnosed in November of ninety nine. Um, yeah. So about a little over eighteen years ago now. Um, yeah. So, so how how did the or, or how did the diagnosis impact your family? So, how did they look at um, you know how they needed to kind of treat you? How they had to how they had to manage you? Was was there any kind of change? in the way that they, they acted towards you? Um, I think it, um, I think it drove anxiety into our lives that maybe wasn't there before. I think, um, I think it's difficult when, I, when you're dealt a medical condition in any family for people to not start to worry. Um, certainly, um, in my household, my dad was the kind of key worrier. My mum was, um, used to type 1 diabetes if you could call it that because her dad actually lived with type 1 so my grandfather was uh, lived with type 1 for a long time so she'd had it in the family so um, my dad was then the kind of one that began to worry he took a lot of the um, control side of it tried to learn a lot of about it as quickly as he could um, my mum was always the um, they, were, they worked really well together because I think my dad kind of did the worry and did the maybe the management side. My mum was maybe the attitude side and the positivity, and she was like, "You're going on school trips. You're going to keep playing football." Like it was, they were kind of a good trade-off. Whereas maybe my dad would worry a bit more about the condition. My mum would be like, "No, you're going to go and do it. You're going to go and smash it. You're going to keep going." So um, they there was obviously a change at the start. They both both worried, but. Um, they're they're quite they were they're a really good mix actually as um as how as how we grew up managing it. Yeah, it sounds like you had a really really good support system there in terms of having your mom and dad on both ends of the spectrum um, to kind of be very uh, 
conservative on one hand, like your dad, but also yeah. providing you with the opportunity to take the chances that your mom provided you with. So that, yeah. that's a really nice mix to have. Now, somewhere that I read also that you had a nurse when you were originally diagnosed that, that basically said to you that, that diabetes is not a limitation. Is that true? Yeah. So I had, um, again, it's one of those, I think one of those defining moments that you get really early on um, and it can make or break you, you know, that kind of those first really important moments. And I always, I, I kind of say this is my first question really after kind of the initial shock was, am I still going to be able to play football again? And it, it was to the pediatrics nurse, uh, Diane Cluley, and she said to me, yes, you will. Um, she said it will require harder, uh, more work uh, and be a bit harder to manage, but you will be able to go on and play football still. So that was the, and once I was given that hook, it was something that I clung on to for as long as I could. And um, I, I think you go from there and you, and you say, well, as long as I can do it, then I'm just going to make the best of it. And, um, and I took and I took and those words and that moment when I asked it still live you know, really vividly in my own memory because it was a, a really important defining moment at the very start of the journey with diabetes, I think. Yeah, that's so amazing. I think that that for anyone, it doesn't have to be diabetes necessarily, but for any challenges that we're facing in life, it's those critical interactions that might just be complete happenstance that yeah. makes such a huge difference for the individual who's impacted, for the families that are impacted. Um, it's, it's that exact thing that I'm hoping that through kind of these conversations that we have on, on the show and then outside of the show also that maybe there's that person who's out there right now who's listening to this that's hearing that from you and saying, look, it's going to be all right. I can do these amazing things regardless of these obstacles that I faced early on in life that make a huge difference for them going forward. It's kind of how you pay it forward in life, right? It's just getting people to continue yeah. on the path and to continue to do amazing things despite the challenges that we're facing. So I appreciate that greatly. Yeah. Um, did you have any heroes growing up? Um, I think when, as, as, a, as a footballer, soccer player, um, I think you look for um, people in the sport, but also for me, I also look to people that lived with my, my medical condition. So I, uh, I had some like key individuals that I looked at from, from a sporting perspective um people like uh certainly around eight or nine it was like Dwight York which you may may have not heard of played for Aston Villa and Manchester United uh I was I'm an Aston Villa fan and um and then from the um kind of the diabetes perspective there's at the time it was uh, Gary Mabbott who everybody in all of the medical um sort of uh, clinics up and down the country in the UK were using as the role model to say to kids that with type one uh, who are interested in football, this is the guy to look at, look at his example. You know, he's played for England, captain Spurs. Uh, he, you know, if he can do it, you can do it. So his name was always somebody um, that would, I guess, use, be used as inspiration for me. Um, and I, you know, I've look, been lucky enough to share a couple of emails with him as well, which was, uh, which was really nice. And um, yeah, so Gary Mabbott was one. Um, and also, obviously, at the time, Sydney 2000, so Steve Redgrave um, won his fifth um, gold medal in the rowing. Um, and he was just diagnosed with diabetes before he did that. Um, so those are the two kind of key individuals that I'd look up to in those early years um, post-diagnosis to, to try and inspire me and to make sure I didn't give up on my dreams of being, a, I guess, a, at that time, a footballer. Yeah, so let's touch on that a little bit because it's clear that that football and for, for all of us uneducated here in the United States, football around the world, <laughs> with the exception of the United States, is technically soccer. Um, yeah. But we're going to refer to it as football here. Um, so, so look, it's a, it's a monstrous sport. There's lots of people who play it all. It's the biggest sport on the planet, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> this is something that ever since you were uh, a kid, you, you, had, you, you were playing and you were trying to figure out how to get better and better. And so that was the dream, I'm guessing, right, is to, to go on to play pro football. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think as a, so many kids dream of in, in the United Kingdom, uh, it's to become a footballer. They come out six, seven years old. All of their idols are football. Not all of them, but a lot of people's idols are footballers. And you go, I want to be just like them. Um, you start kicking a ball around. All your friends kick a football around. It, it, is the, it is the dream. Everybody 
looks at that as to this is where I want to go. This is what I want to be in the future. Um, and obviously at seven, eight years old, I was, I was doing really well. Um, my, I guess my parents were thinking, yeah, he's, he's, he's competing. He's showing real good early signs of he could go on and do, do what he wants to do. And then obviously it's seven, eight, and then eight, nine is where we were obviously dealt with, uh, a big change in the, in the way that things were for me. Um, and I think, um, it, it certainly hampered my progression in my view, looking back now. And I think if you asked parents, coaches around me at the time um, of my diagnosis, I think it probably hampered my, uh, I guess, my sporting progression for a good year, maybe two, maybe maybe a bit longer. I mean, as you'll know, Craig, the kind of uh, the way it was looked after in the late nineties, early two thousands. I was on two injections a day. I was on mixture insulin, which to try and do sport around is let me tell you, it is very, very difficult. And um, I'm sure anybody else that's been on that kind of regime before and tried to do sport will know that it's it's a challenge. Well, maybe you can describe some of, some of the things that, some of the challenges that you faced at that point, because yeah, there's, there's critical moments in our life, in our lives when it comes to, if we, if we want to kind of progress in sports and there's critical mm-hmm. kind of growth periods and and skill periods, et cetera. So what, ex- what exactly made it so challenging at that point for you? I think the, um, there were obviously initial psychological barriers. You go into a big change in your life um, and then you start to, you almost question everything. You become, you're trying to second guess yourself. You don't quite know how to go about doing the things you were doing before. Um, so trying to overcome them at the same time as then physically managing what diabetes is all about was, uh, was a, was a big challenge. And, um, in terms of the way that the regime works, you know, you would have to inject within a half an hour period in this, at the same point in every single day, and you would have to try and eat, um, your meals at the same time every single day, um, and that was just to make, you know, correct it. Then there was the whole, well, how do you fit exercise into that and what effect does that do? Um, we as a family, I mean, I'm grateful to how I was supported, but I think to try and um, progress me as a sport sportsman at the time, I was, you know, an athlete, um, there wasn't the kind of support for exercise with type 1 diabetes. It was a real challenge at uh, that moment to try and get that um, those expertise. I would have needed to have seen, you know, maybe Sir Steve Redgrave's doctor to, to, you know, in his clinic to try and get that that support that I needed to help me transition. And I, you know, at that time, it wasn't forthcoming. There, were, there wasn't that kind of access to that. So um, it was a, you know, a big process of trial and error and. Um, trial and error on a regime which in my view was not designed to kind of put exercise into it as frequently as what I was trying to do were there were there moments I'm guessing there were moments where look there were no continuous glucose monitors at that time so you had no idea what was going on you had to do finger sticks throughout the course of the day yeah as an athlete you're always moving and that yeah. doesn't necessarily, uh, you're traveling to and from games. So your time schedules are, are erratic at times. Um, there's a ton of variability that's outside of your control. And then on top of that, you have no idea half the time where your, where your blood sugars are at because you don't have the CGM technology at that time. Yeah. Um, were there scary episodes that you kind of experienced? Yeah. Well, as you said, the, the kind of variability, I just talked about a structured regime, which didn't really work for just doing exercise on a you know a, a variety of different times so that in itself made it difficult I remember um quite a few t- quite a few occasions where I'd go out on one Sunday and play a game and it'd be completely fine and they'd be like oh yeah Chris is Chris is back Chris is Chris can play um he's back to his old self then the week after kick off at the same time and literally Heart, the shell of what I was before, the I would have a hypo, then a hyper, and you would just go, right, well, today's a write-off. But that at that time in my life, it was too frequent, and it, it the consistency in what I was able to do was, uh, it just wasn't there, and I found it a real challenge. Um, and that's what I say when I think about, you know, what my mum and dad or coaches would have said at that time. 
there was no consistency to what I was able to do. There would be one week where I was great and the next week I'd be like, Pfft. but I would never use the diabetes as an excuse. And that was something that I always, always, and to this day still do. I never use it as an excuse for a bad performance. Um, even though sometimes it is what the reason it happened. Uh, I don't like, I don't like to give it the airtime, I guess, to, to, to give an excuse out. Yeah, it's, that's the reality of it, though, is that is that we have this kind of mindset where we're not going to let things hold us back at all. We're just going to fight through it. We're going to be stronger every day, despite the the challenge that we're facing. But the reality is that it's always in the back of our head from a mindset perspective. And as an athlete in particular, mindset is everything. There's the physical component, right? There's there's I am training. I'm physically ready for this. But at the end of the day, you can be in the best physical shape possible. But if your mind is is questioning anything. You're gonna, you can, you're not gonna succeed. You're just not gonna succeed. No. Um, but ultimately, um, you go on and you kind of figure it all out. You end up playing in college, right? Um, yep. You end up playing semi-pro actually as well. Mm. So despite the challenges that you faced, somehow you figured it all out, and you were able to still compete at a pretty high level, right? Yeah, um, I think. There was a lot of figuring it all out. There was a lot of trial and error. There was uh, so many times where it went wrong, so many times where it went right. But throughout all of those years, you do learn as you go. And I think that's the key to anything is that you, in, in sport, is that you analyze both your performance and you analyze how the, the diabetes went. So after each game, if the diabetes went well, why did it go well? What did I do today that meant that it, it worked? And then also, then I can look at the performance as well. So I, don't, I think most sports people just get to analyse the game, but I'm analysing how well the preparation went, how well the levels went during the game and how they ended up after to then think about what I can do from that routine to put into the future. Because then I think the consistency of that will help me maintain performances in the future. So there's this kind of analysis that I do weekly I still do it now but I'm always thinking as well is that what else can I do to, to kind of change that but I was look at you know I, I said lucky but I worked really really hard at getting that right and as you know with my parents we worked really hard at trying to find those um those routines that worked for different times of the day to make sure I could go out and do the best of, you know play the best of my ability and you know I'm lucky enough now that I can sit here as a and sit and talk about what, what I've done with my sport and and um, yeah, I, I, once I didn't become a professional footballer, um, my next goal was to be paid to play football. And, you know, lucky enough, that was um, something I realised pretty quickly after university, um, which was nice. Um, and then again, through working hard, um, trying things out and doing new things, I was, again, put myself in a position where I was um, in 2016 able to play for my, my country at futsal, which was a special moment um, and one that to this day I still look back on and it fills me with huge, huge pride and um, something you work so hard at as to growing up. And I think with the diabetes, it's um, it's something that you, I talk about the, you know, the, 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 mount, the mountain analogy, you know, that um, the best view comes after the hardest climb. I think you appreciate it that much more when, um, when you live with something like diabetes, when you're able to achieve something. So, so if we can back up just for a second, because you said yeah. you kind of, you, you, through trial and error, are there specific things that over the past, say, 10 or so years that you've had to figure out that, now understanding, and, and I think every, anybody who has type 1 totally understands that every day is a different day, no matter what. Even if we do the same thing every single day, things switch up without our, our yeah. understanding why. But are there mm. maybe one or two things that you found that you're doing in preparation that's part of your kind of your regimen every single day when you're playing or, or practicing that have been uh, proven to be massively helpful for you to kind of at least get on the right foot to function as best as you can when you're out on the field? Yeah, so there's a, there's a kind of, uh, I'd point to a couple of key things that we learned for sort of maybe around the age of maybe 16, 17. So I'd just gone onto my uh, basal bolus regime at about 15 or 16. And I was kind of dealt with, um, we'd play evening games and I'd never played an evening game before. I was playing under floodlights. Um, 
And the, one of the things that we kept noticing was that I was going really high during the game in the evening. Um, I'd be posting, I guess, um, 19, 20 millimoles. I'm not sure how that converts into the state, so, but that's, that's pretty high. Yeah. Um, so we, we kind of learned, oh, looking at it going, why is this happening? So we kind of went to the doctors, went to my diabetic specialist nurse, and she said, why don't you try doing your background insulin before you play in the evening? And literally that sorted it out. And all of a sudden, performance, I where I was struggling, I was unquenchable thirst during games. The performances were hugely improved. So from then on, now I always, before I do any evening um, football or futsal exercise, that maybe starts at 7 or 8 o'clock, I will have my background insulin before it, which is just one trick that, I, that helped me massively. Um, and, then I, um, and then also I've done... I've tried to ensure that meals are spaced out correctly, correctly for me before um, games. So if I think, look at a, maybe a Friday night with a game on a Saturday at three o'clock, uh, Friday night I'm eating sort of seven, seven o'clock in the evening. I, I'll eat a lot of carbohydrates. I almost don't worry about how many carbs I eat. I literally eat and eat until I'm, I'm full because I know that I need to put the kind of the stores in there of, of carbohydrate. And then Saturday morning I wake up at, 8.30, I'm eating breakfast by 9 because what I'm trying to do is squeeze in two, two smallish meals um, with three hours gap to allow the kind of short-term insulin to work, um, almost not touching each other, not interfering with the two meals. So I'd have the, the a kind of breakfast, a couple of pieces of toast by 9 o'clock. And then I would be eating again maybe 12, quarter past 12 with a bit more more carbohydrates than that but not heavy so it would be, kind of be maybe i don't know 110 grams of carbs um at lunchtime but i'm keeping them spaced out by three hours because then again at kickoff at three o'clock i've got a good um a good gauge of of the fact that most of my short-term insulin will have come out of the system and then i'll be able to um get a good read before i go out at three o'clock so the the blood reading then is unlikely to change too much so i know that i this is where i'm at now I can influence that and I've managed to fit in quite a lot of carbohydrates to fuel me for the game. That's a really interesting point because a lot of people, and, and look, I, I've interviewed folks who fall out kind of on all ends of the spectrum when it comes to particular diets. And granted, yeah. you're an athlete, you're going to be burning a lot of calories, you're going to be burning the carbs off, but there's this fear of carbs when we're type one, and there's this this aversion and this uh, desire to avoid carbs at all costs, thinking that it's going to positively impact our blood sugars. 110 grams of carbs for a meal for anyone with type one, they're saying, "Oh my God, what are you ingesting? That's 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 surely you're going high on that." What's your view on carbs? <laughs> carbs are my friend. <laughs> um, I, I think. With the, I, I train, I train or play on five or six days of the week. If I wasn't to eat any carbohydrates or ingest um, a, a diet that has at least a decent amount in each day, I think my energy levels would suffer massively. I've done no carb meals. I've tried cutting out carbs and bringing it down, um, and unless you. You, you know, you want to see a performance suffer in the short term to try and maybe get onto something more long term. Then I'm quite happy with where it is. I always I stick to the you know if it isn't broke, don't try and fix it. And I, I I've got to a place now where I'm happy that I know how to manage around games. I'm happy I know how to manage around um, for perform um, kind of training sessions. So it's it's small tweaks for me. I, and I, I have a diet which. I don't know, across a day, maybe 300 grams of carbs on, on, a, norm, on a normal day. And uh, I'm not overweight. My last HbA1c was 50. Um, so it was kind of like six millimoles-ish. So not badly controlled. And, and I'm eating lots of carbs. So for, for anyone that's kind of thinking, you know, they're not our friends, for me, they kind of are our friends, the carbohydrates. I think we have to look at, at food as, as our fuel and we have to determine what yeah. our what our needs are. And you've clearly over many years at this point figured out what your requirements are. You look, if we're not doing any exercise whatsoever, then clearly carbs are going to drive drive our blood sugars higher unless we're compensating with, with insulin. 
But I think the key, the key here, and the one, one of the things that I think is critical for anyone who has type one or type two diabetes is just moving. The more you move, the less, the less you're going to need to worry about the carb intake, yeah. right? Um, yeah, exactly. So I, I mean, you, I, you can take on, um, I, I can take on food and eat it and not worry about having to inject insulin because there is that much activity in my life that um, I can eat a bar, you know, a protein bar or something after you might have 20 grams of carbs in straight after an exercise session. Don't worry about that though, because I've just burnt it. I'm on the way down. It, all it is, is just balancing things out again. So I agree. I think if we, you know, if we put activity in there, carbohydrates are, you know, the fuel for that activity. And also you, insulin sensitivity increases you know we're it, it's our friend activity and carbs go hand in hand for me um and there are obviously other versions of the of, of how people like to manage it but in my in my world i like the the two together we just got to figure out what works for us ourselves individually yeah. and it, it's it, it is all through experimentation um I still experiment on a, on a regular basis, trying to figure it out. And just when I think I have it figured out, sometimes it just completely crashes yeah. and burns. But that's life, yeah. I guess. Mm. So as we talked about, you you went on to play play uh, in college, uh, semi pro, and and you're also, as you said, you, you're kind of realizing this childhood dream in in a different version of football, which is futsal, right? Yeah. Now I had never heard of that before. I started doing research for you. So I am completely ignorant when it comes to this particular sport. Mm. So for other people out there, and I'm just going to venture to guess that I'm not the only one who doesn't know about the sport. Maybe you can kind of yeah. give us just a little bit of an understanding of the difference between traditional football and futsal. Yeah. So I think uh, to make a good, um, I guess, analogy at this stage, it's like taking basketball and mixing it with football. You, you go to a small, you go to a court, generally inside you play into hockey goals um there's five a, it's five aside the substitutions are roll on roll off uh, it's 20 minutes stop clock similar to basketball when the ball goes out play stops um it's really fast paced really um energetic you give everything you have for kind of three or four minutes at a time um then you get yourself off because there's normally squads of 12 so there's a lot of players there for for people for five people only getting on the court at one time, um, and there tends to be a lot of goals. I mean, I played at the uh, played two games in the last week. One finished eight six, and one finished five five. So, if you want to see goals and and things happening, and um, really, I guess the kind of excitement, real excitement of goals going in as you'd get in football, futsal is a is an amazing sport for that. It sounds similar to hockey to a certain extent with the transitions and the lines and the very fast pace on the go. Um, so, yeah. so that in, in, when you when you start playing that sport versus traditional football, you, you're probably also at that point figuring out, okay, my blood sugars are going to be reacting a little differently because I'm moving faster now, right? Yeah, yeah. I was, it's, it's funny you say that. I'm literally just writing a blog post about it at the moment. Is uh, because it is it is very different in the way that I've had to learn to manage my diabetes. It was a it, it was a, an immediate shot to the system. The, the game suited me from a, um, a technical perspective and what I was like as a footballer, um, which drove me to play in the first place. But not really getting too much help from um, an exercise understanding with the diabetes, I had to learn pretty quickly about what it was doing to my blood sugars. And I think, um, like you said, Greg, at that moment, they started spiking. And I'd never, ever seen... Um, me in a football sense go out play a game and then actually come out higher from after the game than I actually started which so immediately I was like wow this is going to take a lot of them trying to understand and working through and then once you do a bit of research and you start to understand it and you know you do more finger prick checks and around the sport you start to see right okay this is and you again it's the same process that I've always gone through working it out trying to implement a regime that, uh, and a routine that works and then and then small tweaks and keeping the consistency to then tackle it on a on a weekly basis. I'm guessing a portion of, of those spikes probably you could attribute to adrenaline, cortisol, kind of the stress hormone response because the energy is probably a little higher, I'm guessing, than a traditional football game. Yes, yeah. I, I mean, the speed of it is, um, yeah, it, it's, it's breathtaking to go from football to futsal um 
and then you put in 100% effort. It's like sprinting around for three or four minutes. Everything is, is the fastest you can do it pretty much. Um, you're constantly on the move. There isn't a moment where you are stood still because you, the, the rotations that you need to make to open up space for your players means that you are literally moving from one section of the court to the other. So I, I find myself getting on, passing the ball, gone, move. And then once I've moved into one position, my other friend, you know, my other players moved out of his and I'm rotating into his. So you literally non-stop three or four minutes. And, you know, you're trying to fake to move people out of the way, get back in, sprint, opening up space by all of these really sharp and intense movements. And, you know, from from going from a football place where, you know, you can run around for two or three minutes, but you'll be jogging one minute, one minute you might put in a 30-meter sprint, the next you'll be walking for the next two because the ball's on the other side of the pitch or it's gone out, you know, and the, somebody's fetching the ball for 20 minutes. It, that doesn't happen in futsal. You know, the ball comes off the wall, it's straight back in play, somebody's putting it down, playing it. You only get four seconds to hang on to the ball on the sideline as well. So literally, it's it's back in, it's play, it's, it's super quick. I'm probably going to get crucified in some way for asking this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> I, again, completely from an ignorant perspective. But any, I, I, when I was a kid, I was actually very much into soccer here. Mm. When Pele was playing on the Cosmos here, it, it was yeah. a very, it was a big thing. Mm. Um, uh, and I played a little bit of soccer football when I was a kid. Um, but the thing that always strikes me, and I'm wondering if this is the same, th- if, if this occurs also in futsal as well, is the dramatics and the the acting that goes on occasionally uh, during a traditional football game, especially when someone's trying to draw a penalty. Um, yeah. It is some of the, um, at least for, from an outsider perspective, it is some of the most uh, amazing acting that you'll ever see occasionally. <laughs> does that kind of stuff? <laughs> does that kind of stuff happen in futsal as well? Yeah, I think um, in futsal, certainly in the United Kingdom, there's seen there's a lot of. Um, the guys from Europe playing it. So uh, maybe some of the, the British kids are still playing football and they're not really, and we're starting to find futsal now, but um, predominantly in this country, there's still a lot of guys coming from the continent to play. And um, yeah, some of the, the theatrics on the continent um, in European football, as you'll have, you know, you'll be aware of, they, they come straight to futsal as well. So it, it, it's all there. And um I think there's a difference in like non-league football or semi-professional football. There's not so much theatrics in there, but I think in futsal, there's there's still uh, there's still a little bit. Gotcha. So so let's let's talk a little bit about the importance of of including passions in our life because clearly you, you have been very very passionate about sports since you're you're a little kid. Uh, it's carried through your entire young adulthood now into adulthood at this point. So. What's the importance, f- f- putting aside from from the sport perspective, but what's the, what's the personal importance of chasing that passion for you? And then e- the, the second question to that is that a lot of times people will kind of push their passions to the side because life takes over. We go to college, we get a job, we don't have the ability to continue doing things that we're truly passionate about. What's the negative or the downside to completely ignoring our passions? Well... Good, good question for me because these are the, this is something that I guess within the last year and what I've done and in my own life kind of fits in well. I think the passion side of it is is what gets you out of bed in the morning. I think um, for a long time the reason I'd get out of bed and do anything in the morning is knowing that I had football in my life, knowing that I could go and you know I'd have a game that day or be training with the lads or we'd be able to go and talk about that passion, that football for me. Um, it always it always provided that light when it was, when things were dark, you know, you could turn to that passion when you were having a bad day with diabetes, it would give you the the strength to go, you know what, I've got football in my life. I'll always have something that I can cling on to as I really enjoyed it. I was good at it. It was something that, that helped me when I was struggling or things were bad. I think that's what I, I, I see from it. It, it gives you those, those moments when thing when you've got that negative in your mind, you can switch to the positive, and that's what I always used it as. It kind of gave me the the kind of light. Um, and then I guess the second part of your question was that for me, I made a I made a big choice in the last year where I was working in a job um, which 
was nowhere near my passion. Um, I'd done a sports degree. Um, I then came out of university and I was working full time in a um, in a retail company. So I was doing sort of buying in retail. So I was purchasing goods, purchasing materials, kind of for a big retail in the UK. And um, it was never it was never what I'd loved doing. So I. I was looking for what I could do in, in, in sport. It was always there. It's always been my love. And then, you know, the idea came around for the diabetes football community. It was something that I'd looked for when I left university, but I maybe didn't have like the experience, the the know-how, the maybe some of the kind of business brain and the marketing brain that I had after working in retail to kind of make it happen. And then it was, then I had that, that, amazing moment I guess in the summer where I went you know what I'm going to go after the passion and for the time being you know it was I had an opportunity in my life right at that moment to make a decision between carrying on doing the career I was doing or changing and going after the passion and I think it's so important if you can to continue to do what you what you're passionate about if you have that opportunity you can't say no and I, I said to myself go after it follow that dream for the for however long it it is until you can't follow it any longer go and chase it down so because it's the thing that drives you forward um and I spent and I've spent the last sort of six seven months being able to be um a full-time student again um studying around very much the idea of the diabetes football community which is amazing in itself I'm able to do my research master's degree on it and um and then at the same time, uh, get the backing of the university that I'm at to to kind of drive the diabetes football community forward. So we're um, it, it's been I couldn't couldn't have asked for anything better really at this stage of, as to what I've been able to do. But um, I think it is so so important to to go after it for as long as you can. Yeah, it's it's rare, but I think that what your mindset is becoming a little bit more more uh, mainstream and popular with. Uh, with younger generations, I think now is, mm-hmm. is, is this concept of chasing what you're passionate about versus just chasing the money at, at the beginning. Uh, because ultimately life is more about, uh, making an impact, doing things that you believe in to, uh, to keep yourself, as you said, getting out of bed every morning to give yourself a purpose, uh, every single day. Um, let's talk a little bit about the diabetes football community, because as I said, at the top of the show, it's, it's a relatively new organization. You launched it last year. Um, what was the what was the kind of um, was there a catalyst for you launching it aside from just having a passion for football was there a, a reason that was kind of simmering in the background for you that you said one day this is what I'd like to launch yeah so I think um, after playing football for as long as I had I'd kind of spent 17 18 years um, understanding what it was like to be a type one diabetic in the sport and I'd never kind of felt any backing or support from anybody within the football family um then nobody had ever understood it coaches had never understood it people involved in organizing the sport never understood it referees had never understood the the condition um so I always felt there was a huge huge gap in um that relied so heavily on myself to help educate people um my parents to educate the people around them and the coaches, etc. And I'd always felt there was a real strong disconnect for us. I mean, it's the biggest chronic medical condition affecting children. Yet there's no, there's no, there's no real support. I talk about type one diabetes um, in this country. I, I'm assuming it's the same in the states and probably elsewhere. That it is by law classified as a disability whether we want to identify with it or not it's classified as a disability yet you take part in mainstream sport so there's this little there's this gray area where you you kind of fit in a a a round uh, you know a square peg in a round hole you're not quite fitting into mainstream sport as the way that they intended you to fit in there's no you know you go into a dressing room and there's um or the locker room, as it would be called, the, you know, it's, you've got 15 other 15 year olds and you've got to pull out an injection pen and a blood glucose monitor. And there's all of the kind of the banter and the laughs and the jokes. And you have to try and feel comfortable in that environment. That's not easy to do. Um, 
and there's no understanding and that, you know people will ask awkward questions difficult questions so i you know i felt passionately about how to how do we make that easier that kids kids are still finding it now and i'm still hearing it all of the time that there, there is this real challenge for them where they, they don't quite they're not you know they fit in but there's differences for them that we that's not accounted for and that was a big part of what the the kind of the ambition and the the idea behind it is i felt all of that um i felt that i'd spent enough time understanding the sport i guess um having played for my country at futsal i felt at that time it was a good opportunity then to say you know um, i've I've learned a lot. I've I've managed to I've managed to push myself to to a limit. I didn't I wasn't sure I'd ever kind of get to be able to do that in any sport with type one diabetes. I was lucky enough to do it, and I felt at that moment it was the right time to go. This is it. You've spot. You know this gap is huge. How do you address it? You you've done well. Let's let's see what we can do to pull it together. So and and that in that moment was the the kind of the spark for me to say. Right, this is the idea and then social media the growth of social media from sort of 2012 when I left university to 2017 when the idea came up was huge you know those five years massive for social media and it all all of a sudden it became apparent that this was a you know people talk about how destructive it can be but in this situation it has literally been the most constructive mechanism we could have used to to pull this idea off and uh you know, started with a Twitter account in uh, on February the 26th. So from where we're talking, Craig, we're almost the, almost on the year anniversary yeah. of um, of TDFC starting. So and, and what an amazing 12 months it's been. But yeah, they kind of it was all born from experience and um, and and the spark of um, of trying to do something for other people that um, addressed that gap. That's usually where the best ideas come from is when there's this kind of gap in service or knowledge or uh, community um, and frustration. Those those are some elements for starting a really, really important uh, venture. So congratulations on that. I know it, the, the first year is always the hardest. Um, but uh, it, it's as you said, there's there seems to be a lot of momentum uh, and support behind what you're doing. Um, I'm just curious. So, so you're talking about offering mindset tools and it's not just about the physical components of, of, of football it's really about how we're developing our mindset and changing also society's mindset surrounding type one as well so it goes beyond just football yeah yeah i i'm talking at the moment um a lot of what we're trying to do is to help support people that have got the condition so you know we're doing live chats with people on facebook so we put ourselves on you know on screen and say come and ask us questions on different topics which is great to be able to interact in that instantaneous um moment um then I'm, you know we're doing blog posts on different things we're putting out that kind of education side for for people with a condition but also at the same time we want to showcase it to the world as well and say you know put a positive spin on it which is where kind of the idea for creating the first all diabetic uk futsal team for a tournament um called dia euro came from and also to kind of support that is um, an idea about awareness and, and educating people that within society about type 1 diabetes, which is uh, an idea that I've got at the moment, which we're working on around a video, you know, 24 hours in the life of um, a diabetic footballer, which, again, you know, gives us that opportunity to I, I really want it to be pushed from the kind of the governing body for football in this country because I think if we can you know if we use organizations you know I'm not discrediting them in any way because they do an amazing job but if you use people like JDRF and in our you know in the UK Diabetes UK their reach is to other people with diabetes you know what they put out reaches people with diabetes if we're trying to change a mindset within society we need to go beyond them we need to use organizations that aren't diabetes focused to help change how people think so i'm hoping to use the football association you know other sporting organizations the university that i'm at as well to help me push that um, agenda because we, we won't see any difference in in how people are treated in you know whether it's sport or whether it's a different walk of life until we until we, you know, we push them to make a change, and I think by by including them and actually having them drive the message is is the way to do it. 
I really love the fact that you're using football as the vehicle to make a greater mm -hmm. impact outside of the sport as well. It starts with football, as you're describing, but it is a much bigger picture that you have in mind. So you have you have a lot of work ahead of you. There's no doubt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of work. I think, but I I think yeah, like you say, I, I was I, the vision was football and diabetes because that was my strength. That's what I knew well. But I think there's a you know by using the hook of the world's biggest sport with the condition that's affecting the most you know the biggest chronic medical condition affecting children you're already bringing two very very big uh, parts of society together which hopefully we can help influence how you know the one part is is um is thought of yeah so I just have a, a couple of final questions and all the things that mm. we're, we're talking about with respect to the Diabetes Football Club and uh, community, um, I'm going to make sure that we have links to everything on, on the site, on my site as well and within the show notes. So anybody who's interested, whether you're in the US, the UK, anywhere around the world, you'll be able to find the website and kind of learn more about uh, what Chris is doing as well. A um, couple of more questions about mindset uh, and then I'm going to let you go. Uh, yeah, I that's do really, cool. I do really appreciate your time. So... Um, Something I wanted to ask you before. So th there's a, a previous interview that I read uh, of yours online, and you're you you're quoted as saying, "Only my nearest and dearest see what I go through on a daily basis. Everyone else just sees the smile and positive attitude that drives me to achieve." So clearly, in that, I'm assuming that you're talking about your life with diabetes. Now, mm -hmm. not everyone has the ability to hold things together and to present a positive attitude to the outside world, despite the turmoil that we might be facing and kind of dealing with on the inside or the challenges that we might be facing in private. We all face yeah. our battles on, on, on a private level. Um, mm. how, how were you able to kind of develop that? Is that just a personality trait? Is that nature or is that nurture? Um, I think it probably comes from an, er an early place where, um, when type one diabetes came into my life, I didn't want to, I, I I hid that quite well from people because I immediately wanted to just I wanted to be judged on merit in my sport, which kind of led me to then hiding the rest of the condition and all of the struggles that went with it and the the battles that I face on a daily basis and kept it very in house because then it allowed me if I could keep it there and keep it in this box I guess over here I could go out and and play um, and have minimal kind of impact from it. And it would touch my life very minimally as I was out playing. Um, I think I, I just I just tried to internalize it, and over the years, it became kind of normal to internalize it and keep it away from everybody else. Um, I, I like to think of it as the it, it is the fuel to the fire um, that drives me forward because I just I just used it to. To, to overcome the little battles that I had outside. I, I wanted everything to be... I didn't want it to come across as perfect, but I wanted it to, to come across where nothing was holding me back and I didn't want to let people see that type 1 was a, cha was a challenge. I wanted to see that Chris does, Chris does great, Chris, you know, Chris can do this, Chris can do that, because I didn't want people to see that it was, it was a difficult um, situation. I talk about it more and more now, um, about the challenges, but I, I wanted to do everything um, based on merit. So I wanted to see that, see me do well first, and then we can talk about what the diabetes was doing to me after. Um, because it, at that point, it was you know something that I didn't. It's it's kind of it's kind of hard to like get it across, but it was it was something that I just wanted to to put somewhere else and allow me to go and do me. Um, and it's something that I, I've just, I've learned to do over the years and, and I've continued to do it now. Um, but I like to talk about it now because, because of what we do now with the diabetes football community, I like to show people now that there's a, there is this other side to me that maybe they've never seen before. I would go to university or go to school and there's so many people out there I've mixed with over the years and I never knew I was diabetic. And all of a sudden I come out and start talking about it now and, almost expressing those feelings that maybe I'd held and boxed away for years. And they're seeing um, maybe a different side to me and a different side to the condition because it's, um, 
that's just the way I've dealt with. And, you know, there's been lots and lots of battles and lots of battles in my own mindset. Um, but, but now I feel in a place where I can talk about it, which is, which is nice as well. Yeah. And, and, and what I'm about to say, by no means do I believe that diabetes is self-imposed or self-inflicted. So I'm not about, that's not what I'm saying right now, but what is mm. self-imposed oftentimes and it takes a really long time to figure this out, and I'm still trying to figure this out, is that limitations are self-imposed. It's it, The condition is something we have no control over necessarily, but how we think about it and then ultimately how we overcome the day-to-day, -day, uh, those limitations are self-imposed. So we don't have to add fuel to that fire necessarily in knocking ourselves down every single day because we were already seen as kind of having, and, and I don't see it as a di disadvantage. I actually see diabetes to a certain extent as an advantage in mindset for myself. I'm starting to realize that. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, it's, we don't need the additional limitation thought process because of the condition. Hopefully that came across the way I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So two final questions. No, I for agree you. With you. Yeah. Two final questions for you. What are you most grateful for right now? Ooh, um, most grateful for, I think probably, um, the diabetes football community and the people that have, um, responded to, to the idea, the people that continue to support us, that follow us, that interact and share the cause. Um, something I never, ever in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be staring at the position that it's in now after, you know, we're pretty much a year later, um, I'm so grateful for how it's been um, supported within the diabetes community and um, I'm really, really excited about it. Just incredibly um, blessed to be able to be, I guess, the the um, the founder of it, the idea, the man who created the idea. And um, I, I thank, you know, thank everybody around me for giving me this, you know, the structures and the support to be able to go on and uh, um, front that and continues to drive it forward. It's probably the, the, the number one at the moment, I'd say. That's great. So again, I'm going to have links to your social media accounts, the diabetes football community. Also, you talked a little bit about uh, sponsorships surrounding this first all type one yes. um, uh, team that we're going to have information about also on there. Um, last question for you. How would you describe someone who's brave? Wow. I was thinking about it earlier because I was I'd listened to a few podcasts and I knew this question was coming. Um, <laughs> I um, I think it's about the ability to overcome adversity and challenges that are put in front of you. I think um, that's the greatest sign of somebody that's brave. The the fact that they've got that ability to take a difficult situation take the, whatever challenge that might be thrown in front of them and then to have the, the mindset to tackle it um, and then push past it. That's great. So, so look, I, I want to just say thank you very much again for taking the time to talk with me today. Um, you, as we've learned throughout today's episode and today's show, you've taken that, uh, those challenges on a day-to-day -day basis from the time you were eight years old on, trying to figure it out, and now you're doing something that it, I would hope that everyone would consider doing is taking our knowledge, taking our experiences, and then sharing that with everyone around us who can benefit from it. And that's exactly what you're doing with the diabetes football community. So I applaud you for putting that together. I know how difficult it is to put things like that together and actually make it work now going on a year, which is incredible in and of itself. Uh, I wish you the best of luck with all that. And of course, anything that I can do to support you in the future, I'm around for you. So thank you again. And I look forward to kind of catching up with you again as this evolves for you. No, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. And um, yeah, um, anything that I can do as well in the same way, Craig, where, um, you know, we all fight the same cause at the end of the day with type one. Agreed. Thanks so much. We'll talk soon. All right. Cheers, Craig. So how about that, Mr. Chris Bright, all the way from the UK. Hope you guys got a lot out of that episode. I personally appreciate Chris's energy as well as his key message of being that person to show the world how to start pulling down barriers if there's something that we believe in strongly enough. Please check out the diabetes football community and make sure you support all of Chris's efforts. I'll have everything linked up in the show notes for this episode. It'll be on the website at thebravestlife.com forward slash 036. And finally, I know you guys know 
how important reviews are on iTunes. When you share your thoughts about the show on iTunes, it makes it a whole lot easier for the world to find us. So if you haven't done so already, and if you like the show, please consider heading over to iTunes to leave your own review. It takes just a minute or two, so please let the world know what you think. All right, guys, thanks again for joining me this week. We have an amazing guest coming up next week, so make sure you don't miss that episode. I'm Craig, and I will see you next week. Take care, guys.